scientists are not eliminating God. The eliminating models of God. You learn Sanskrit. Go back to your scriptures. Go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after they identified that they're females. According to the statutes of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I've been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Of the West. To give, it's time to live honestly with no pretense. It's time to share, it's time to care about every move you make. It's time to share and to declare the hope of my heart won't break. It will never break. especially happy to see that, alhamdulillah, we have in our midst an international scholar of the repute of Dr. Zakir Naik, who shall be addressing you shortly. So please kindly take your seats and be ready and paired, inshallah, for what is going to be an amazing evening. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فأما الإنسان إذا ما ابتلاه ربه إذا ما ابتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونأمه فيقول فيقول ربي أكرما وأما فيقول ربي أهانا كلا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ أَكْلًا لَمَّا وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمًّا صدق الله العلي Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have been interested to present the brief translation of these few ayat. These ayats are from Surah Al Fajr and it explains about the shared problem of humanity. When Allah favors a human being by making him well off and rich, then human beings become proud of themselves, saying, I am a person of honor. And when Allah subhanahu ta'ala puts human being through a trial of limited livelihood, 
and hardship, then human being becomes very pessimist and he says that Allah has made me live in a derogatory situation. But Kalla Bal, Allah Ta'ala is saying there is no need to be proud or need to be put down yourself, but we should work to criminal yatim. We all human beings, Muslims and non Muslims, should honor and dignify the orphans and we should encourage each other for charitable work to feed the poor and should not try to eat up the common and shared and mal bequest wealth in an un-Islamic manner, in an illegitimate manner. So the solution to all the differences in the human being is to look after yatim, to feed the poor and do the charitable and good deed in our life. And by this way, inshallah, we are going to make impact in this society where the majority of people are non-Muslims and Islam and Muslims will earn good name, inshallah. Jazakumullah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, Swaikbal Sakrani, respected guests and elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. I am truly humbled here today before you for the opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon me to address this distinguished gathering and I thank him for this. May I take this opportunity of warmly welcoming you all to the lecture program of Dr. Zakir Naik organized by the Islamic Association of North London in cooperation with the Harrow Central Mosque. Please allow me to introduce my panel to you and also to explain the program format for tonight, inshallah. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Bashir Sattar, and I am chairman of the Islamic Association of North London. It is my pleasure to be your host and program director for this evening, inshallah. To my right, and from the far end, we have Mufti Abdul Qadir Barkatullah, who is the Honorable Secretary of the Islamic Association of North London. And next to him, we have Dr. Mumre Zawan Khan, who is Vice Chairman. Then we have Brother Shahid Akmal, who is Chairman of the Harrow Central Mosque. And then we have Sir Iqbal Sakrani, who is the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, also known as MCB. And sitting to his left, the eminent scholar from Mumbai, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. I would now like to explain the format for this evening, and this will be as follows. After myself, I will be asking Sir Iqbal to introduce this evening's guest speaker. After Dr. Saab's lecture, there will be a question and answer session, and I will provide the rules and the process for conducting this part of the program, which will be a little later on. The Q&A session will be followed by a recital of reflection of the program by Brother Shahid Akmal. I would also just like to say that we at the Islamic Association of North London felt it was an opportunity in the aftermath of 7-7 to reflect on our duties and responsibilities and roles as Muslims in this non-Muslim society and put matters into perspective in the Islamic context for the benefit of both Muslims 
and non-Muslims. And who else better than our very own Dr. Zakir Bhai to provide that very inspiration, inshallah. As many of you are aware, this lecture has been arranged at very short notice. So please forgive our shortcomings or errors. We hope that this lecture will bring benefit and enlightenment to us all. And we sincerely hope you enjoy this evening, inshallah. May I now invite Sir Iqbal Sakrani to the podium. Jazakallah khair. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Nahmudu wa nasulli ala Rasulil Kareem. Our distinguished scholar of this evening, Dr. Zakir Naik, Brother Bashir and Brother Shahid, the management committee members of the Islamic North London Association and the Hero Central Mosque. Distinguished scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is indeed my privilege to introduce our chief guest this evening, a person who perhaps requires no introduction whatsoever. But however, the introduction is needed to remind ourselves of the wonderful work in terms of dawah that has been carried out, the much needed dawah work in today's times that is carried out by this personality which is beamed over around the world daily for sometimes two hours to up to four hours every single day by major national television stations and many other small channels trying to get the message, the central message as to who we are, what is the deen of Islam and its role in the society at large. Dr. Naik, alhamdulillah, is a medical doctor by profession. But it is now more than 14 years that he felt that he had served to treat the body, the human body. But perhaps it was now time to treat the soul. And in that aspect, the work that has been carried out is more of a full-time work. He has established a renowned research institute in Bombay, which employs more than 200 people with different scholars being trained to give lectures in different parts of the world. It is that much needed work that makes us feel comfortable that in all the challenges that we are facing, not just in the UK, in the Muslim worlds, but the world over, and it is such renowned speakers that can bring the message of understanding, message of mutual understanding, respect, tolerance, and to give the true image of Islam, which sadly is being confused and manipulated by those who do not wish to see Islam grow and progress in this modern world. Therefore, with these few words, I'm delighted to introduce our respected scholar, but before he comes in, may I take the opportunity to thank the organizers of both the institutions, the North London Islamic Association and the Herald Central Mosque, for organizing this wonderful event within such a short period of time. And it shows the interest within the Muslim community to hear uh, from such distinguished scholars the message that they want to convey to us so that we, in our daily lives, can try and bring that message to show the world at large who we are and what are the teachings of Islam. May Allah guide us through these difficult times that we are moving through, and we hope and pray we'll have more such opportunities in our daily lives to hear from our distinguished scholar, Dr. Zakir Naik. Asalaamu Alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbi ajmain. Amma bad. A'uzu billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lil nas. 
تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله رب شوه لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه كولي The respected people on the dais my respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is the role of the Muslims in a non-Muslim society. First, let us understand what is the meaning of the word Muslim. Muslim means a person who follows Islam. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It is also derived from the Arabic word silm, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God and acquires peace is called as a Muslim. So in short, Muslim is a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. As far as the role of the Muslims in a non-Muslim society is concerned, it can be divided broadly into two categories. The first is the actions and deeds related to himself and the other is the actions and deeds related to the non-Muslim as far as the first category is concerned that is the actions and deeds of a Muslim related to himself it is the same irrespective whether that Muslim lives in a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society the actions and the deeds are the same there are certain concessions given in certain situations, but it does not differ whether the Muslim is living in a Muslim society or the non-Muslim society, it is the same. For example, what is fard? What is compulsory for a Muslim in a Muslim society is also fard, is also compulsory for a Muslim in a non-Muslim society. For example, Every Muslim has to believe and worship only one Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Irrespective whether he's living in a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society, he should believe in Tawheed. He should worship only one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim has to pay five times a day, minimum, in a Muslim society. The same has to be done by that Muslim even if he lives in a non-Muslim society. Fine, there may be different situations. In a Muslim society, there may be a mosque in every area. There may be a mosque in every second street, which may not be the case in a non-Muslim society. But yet, if a Muslim is living in a non-Muslim society, he has to offer five times salah. It is compulsory. It is fard. If the mosque is not close by, or he has to travel long and he cannot do that, he has to offer salah maybe in his office or at home, but salah is fard. He has no excuse to miss it. A Muslim, irrespective whether he is living in a Muslim or a non-Muslim society, he has to give zakat. If he is entitled to give, if he has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth, of that saving, every lunar year in charity. A Muslim cannot say that he's living in a non-Muslim society and the standard of living is high or the place where he's living, it is expensive, therefore he will not give zakat. If he has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give zakat every year. A Muslim, irrespective of whether they're living in a Muslim or a non-Muslim society, 
he has to fast in the month of Ramadan. If the days are short in winter, maybe the timings will be less. If it's in summer where the days are long, the timing of the fast would be longer. But he has to fast compulsory. He has no excuse. If he lives in a non-Muslim society, he has no excuse. He has to fast. Similarly, a Muslim, if he has the means to perform Hajj, if he's an adult, he should at least perform Hajj once in his lifetime. If he has the means, health and money, he has to offer Hajj. There's no excuse, even if he's living in a non-Muslim society. He may be living far away from Saudi Arabia, from Makkah. But if he has the means to travel that distance, he has to offer Hajj, at least once in his lifetime, it is far. In this way, all the faraiz, all the actions and deeds which are compulsory for a Muslim in a Muslim society is also compulsory in a non-Muslim society. A Muslim woman, she has to do hijab irrespective of whether she's living in a Muslim or non-Muslim society. She has no excuse that she's living in a non-Muslim society. That's the reason she will not do hijab. There's no excuse. It's a fard. It has to be done. In this way, all the other fards, being honest, speaking the truth, it is the same. It does not differ. Similarly, what is haram for a Muslim? In a Muslim society, is also haram for a Muslim in a non-Muslim society. Whichever part of the world he lives in, shirk is haram, he is living in a Muslim society, it's also haram if he's living in a non-Muslim society. There's no excuse that because he's staying in a non-Muslim society or a Western country, he can do shirk. It's haram throughout the world. Similarly, fornication and adultery. It is haram for a Muslim, irrespective whether he's living in a Muslim or non-Muslim society. Irrespective which part of the world he lives in. Pork is haram, whether he lives in a Muslim country or non-Muslim country. Having non-Zabia food, non-Halal food, any meat which is not sorted by the Islamic method or which Quran does not give permission to, it is haram irrespective whether he's living in a Muslim or non-Muslim society. In short, whatever is fard and whatever is haram for a Muslim, it is the same throughout the world irrespective whether they're living in a Muslim or a non-Muslim society. There are many Muslims who give excuse that because I'm living in a Western country or because I'm living in a non-Muslim society, some things are excused. What is fard is fard. What is haram is haram. As far as the other aspects are concerned, regarding mustahab, things which are encouraged, those which are considered as sunnah, mustahab, thing which is encouraged, it is the same also, but there may be a little bit leniency. For example, covering the head for a Muslim man or wearing a cap is mustahab. It is the sunnah of the Prophet. But if you feel that are living in a non-Muslim society and you feel that wearing a cap may endanger your life, and if you want to avoid that act, you can do it. Because wearing a cap is not fard in Islam. If you do it, you will get plus points. If you don't do it, you have no loss. But you will not get the plus points. So living in a non-Muslim society, the things which is mustahab, if you fear regarding certain aspects and you avoid it, you will not get the plus points. Similarly, things which are makru, things which are discouraged, or the same throughout the world. But they can be a little bit leniency. For example, going for the call of nature, standing and doing the call of nature, it is makru. But if you know living in a Western country and the toilets may not permit you, and if you do it, there is no problem, but you will lose the plus points. You don't gain negative points. So as far as the fard and the harams are concerned, there is no excuse at all. As far as the other aspects are concerned, 
about the sunnah and the makru. If you want to avoid it for certain reason, you can do it. You will not get negative points, but you will lose the positive points. This was in short regarding the first category of a behavior of a Muslim in a non-Muslim society. As far as the second category is concerned, the role of a Muslim in a non-Muslim society, as far as relationships with a non-Muslim is concerned, as far as actions and deeds with a non-Muslim is concerned, it can be further divided into three subcategories. The first is general dealing with the non-Muslim. The second is special relationships with the non-Muslims. And the third is dawa with the non-Muslims. As far as the first subcategory is concerned regarding the general dealings of a Muslim with the non-Muslims, it is the same. You have to be honest with the non-Muslim. You have to be kind to him. You have to be just with him. You have to be merciful. As far as the general dealing is concerned, in day-to-day -day life, which does not directly concern harming your iman, then how you deal with a Muslim, you have to deal the same way with a non-Muslim in general day-to-day -day dealings. And there are many Muslims who say, ah, he's a non-Muslim. You know, so if I cheat him, it's not a problem. Islam does not give you permission to cheat anyone, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. Islam does not give you permission to deal unjustly, whether the Muslim or with the non-Muslim. It's the same. And this can be derived from two verses of the glorious Quran, from Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8 and 9. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 8, that Allah forbids you not as far as those non-Muslims are concerned, who fight you not for your faith, nor drive you out of your homes from dealing with them with justice and kindness. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who are just and kind. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that as far as the non-Muslims are concerned, as long as they do not fight you for your faith, for your iman, or do not drive you out of your home. Allah forbids you not from dealing with them with justice and kindness. For Allah loves those who are just and kind. But the next verse of the Quran, Allah says, in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 9, but Allah forbids you only as far as those non-Muslims are concerned who fight for your faith and drive you out of your homes or support those people who indulge in these activities. Allah forbids you from keeping friendship and asking for protection from these people. So if a non-Muslim fights you for your faith or drives you out of your home or supports those people who fight you for your faith or drive you out of the homes, Allah forbids you from going to them for friendship or for protection. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear that under normal circumstances, with a non-Muslim, you have to deal justly and kindly. Unless he fights for your faith or drives out of your home. And there's a verse in the Quran, which many of the Muslims, they misunderstand. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 144, where Allah says, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, O you who believe, Take not for awliya, the unbelievers, in preference to the believers. And many of the translations, they translate the Arabic word awliya as friends. So the translation reads that, O oh, you who believe, do not take for friends, unbelievers, in preference to believers. Which I feel it's a wrong translation. The correct translation is, the word awliya should be translated as someone who's a protector. So the right translation is that Ya ayyuhal lazin amanu, O you who believe, 
do not take for protectors unbelievers in preference to believers. Do not take for protectors non-Muslims in preference to Muslims. And the same message is repeated in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 57 and 58. That, O oh, you who believe, do not take for friends and protectors those who make a mockery of religion or take it as a sport. That means all those non-Muslims who take your deen as a mockery or as a sport, do not keep friendship with them, nor go to them for protection. These verses of the Quran are very clear. But otherwise, keeping acquaintanceship with a non-Muslim, keeping normal friendship with a non-Muslim is no problem at all. Under normal circumstances, we should treat the non-Muslims with justice and kindness. In fact, I say we should go a step further so that they're impressed with our religion, they're impressed with our deen. And you can find several examples in the life history of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Several. You can give a talk only on giving examples how the Prophet dealt with the non-Muslims. And many of us are aware of that incidence where a non-Muslim he enters the mosque of the Prophet and he urinates. The Sahabas are irritated. They want to teach the non-Muslim a lesson, but the Prophet, he stops them. And he says, be calm. Get some water and wash the floor. That's it. We know of the famous incidents. Whenever Prophet Muhammad used to walk, there was a non-Muslim lady who used to throw dirt on the Prophet every day. Whenever he used to walk, the non-Muslim lady used to throw dirt. One day, when the Prophet walks below the house of that non-Muslim lady, no dirt falls on him. So he's surprised. He goes to a house to find out why was no dirt thrown today. And he realizes that she was sick and he prays for a shifa. And that non-Muslim lady, she's so impressed with the Prophet that she accepts Islam. We have the example in the seerah of the Prophet Muhammad that there was a Jew by the name of Zaid. The Prophet had borrowed some money from him. But before the time was due, that Jew, he comes to the Prophet and he demands for the money back. And he's rude. He speaks rudely to the Prophet that give my money back. And the time was not yet up. Hadat Umar he gets angry. And he says, Oh, enemy of God, had it not been for the treaty between the Muslims and the Jews, I would have chopped off your head for speaking to the Prophet like that. Hazrat Umar, we know that he was a man of justice. He gets irritated. How could someone speak to the Prophet of Allah like that? The Prophet immediately intervenes and he tells Hazrat Umar that be calm. And he tells Hazrat Umar that give this Jew his money back and add to it the amount of 20 gallons because you frightened him. Because Hazrat Umar frightened him, the man did not have the right to ask the money because the time wasn't yet up. The time wasn't due. Yet because Hazrat Umar he frightened that non-Muslim, the Prophet said besides giving the money back to him, add 20 gallons worth because he had frightened the Jew. And Alhamdulillah, the Jew is impressed with the behavior of the Prophet and he accepts Islam. So generally, the Muslims should be kind and just to the non-Muslims. We have to be the right example so that they'll realize we are the followers of the religion of peace. A Muslim is a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as far as general dealing is concerned, we have to be kind and just. But there is a caution, which I always mention in my talk, whenever I'm dealing with this topic, that keeping non-Muslim friends is no problem as long as you are having an influence on that non-Muslim. If it's the vice versa, then there is a danger. If the non-Muslim friend 
is having a greater influence on you, then there is a problem. Because whenever there is a relationship between two human beings, and when you keep on meeting very often, no one can tell me that nothing happens. Either you are influencing him or he is influencing you. You can't say that nothing is happening. So if you are having influence on him, Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, continue the relationship so that he understands the deen al haq the religion of Islam better. But if he's having influence on you, then be careful. You may follow his path, which may be wrong. So here, if it's a relationship in which your deen is in danger, then I feel you have to discontinue that relationship. You have to be careful. The Quran is very clear. As far as protection is concerned, if there are two options, believer and unbeliever, a believer is preferable at all times. The verse says, do not take unbelievers for protectors in preference to believers. So as far as your deen is not in danger, and if you are having an influence on the non-Muslim, Alhamdulillah. And I, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have hundreds of non-Muslim friends. MashaAllah, hundreds. Hindus, Christians, many. And almost all that I know, they respect me, mashallah. They know that I'm a dai. I speak about the religion. Yet, alhamdulillah, they respect me. So as long as you are having influence on them, it's very good. In terms of special relationship where your deen is in danger, I'd like to give an example. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, that the believing man a Muslim should not marry a mushrika, an idolatrous, an unbelieving woman, unless she believes. A believing woman who is a slave woman is better than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. That means a Muslim man cannot marry a non-Muslim woman, a woman who does idol worship, who does shirk, unless she believes, unless she becomes a Muslim, unless she becomes a woman. Because a Muslim, a woman, a believing woman is far better than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. Means in preference to marry a Muslim woman even if she may be a slave woman. She may be a bond woman. She may be a very poor woman. She may be an ugly woman. If she has faith, she is far superior than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. She may be the most beautiful woman in the world. She may be the richest woman in the world. Yet, a Muslim, a believing woman who is poor and ugly is far superior than an unbelieving woman. And the same goes vice versa, that a believing woman should not marry an unbelieving man, a mushrik man, until he believes. A believing man, even if he's a slave man, he's far superior to a man who does shirk. Even he may allow you. He may be the most handsome man in the world. He may be the richest man in the world. He may be the king of the country. But a believing man, even if he's poor, even if he's ugly, he's far better in marriage than a mushrik man. So here, because the relationship is concerned, that if you marry a non-Muslim, if you marry a mushrika or a mushrik, your deen is in danger. That's the reason it is prohibited for a Muslim to marry a non-Muslim, marry a mushrik. Otherwise, under normal circumstances, in general dealing, you have to be kind to the non-Muslim. We come to the third subcategory of the role of a Muslim in non-Muslim society that is dealing with the non-Muslims. And that third subcategory is dawa. What is the meaning of the Arabic word dawa? Those who come from the Indian subcontinent, they know the meaning of the word Dawat. The moment you hear the word Dawat, you start thinking of a biryani or a pulao. Dawa ya Dawat does not mean biryani or pulao. Dawa means to call, to invite. And an invitation can only be given to an outsider. 
So dawah specifically means inviting a non-Muslim towards Islam. When you speak about Islam to a Muslim, the more appropriate word is islah, which means to repair, which means to improve. But when we speak about Islam to a non-Muslim, inviting him towards Islam, the more appropriate word is dawah. Though this word dawah is used synonymously both while speaking to Muslim as well as non-Muslims, but specifically dawah means inviting the non-Muslims towards Islam. And this dawah is a fard on every Muslim, especially those Muslims who are living in a non-Muslim society. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3. Verse 110, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kuntum khaira ummatan ukhrijat linnas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us khaira ummah, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with a responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. But simultaneously, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. There is no honor without responsibility. Allah is giving us an honor in the Quran as calling us the Khaira Ummah. Ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse. Allah continues and says, Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhauna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoin what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah. We aren't fit to be called as Muslims. It is compulsory for every Muslim that he invites the non-Muslims. He invites them towards the good and forbids them from doing wrong and believe in Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38, that if you do not do your job, if you do not follow the responsibility Allah has given you, Allah says, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laknam salakum. And they will not be like you. If you do not do your job, if you do not follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will substitute in your place another people and they will not be like you. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 143, that we have made you an ummah a middlemost community, so that you may be a witness over the nations as the Prophet will be a witness over you. It is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. I'd like to ask you a question. Suppose you go away from your home, from your house for work, and your neighbor, he abuses your mother. He uses foul language against your mother when you come back home and when you come to know that your neighbor has used foul language against your mother, what will you do? What will you do? When you get back home and you come to know that your neighbor has used foul language against your mother for no reason at all. And when you get back home and when you come to know about this, what will you do? What will you do? What will you do? Beat him up. What will you do? Bash him. What will you do? Kill him. <laughs> One brother is saying, beat him up. Other brother is saying, bash him. Third person is saying, kill him. When you get back home and you come to know that your neighbor has abused, used foul language against your mother for no rhyme or reason, someone wants to beat him up, someone wants to bash him, someone wants to kill him. But you see to it that your neighbor is taught a lesson. Will you or not? Yes or no? Of course, if you cannot do it yourself, you will hire someone else to do the job. 
Yes or no? Of course. Because we love our mother. We respect our mother. Fine? We'll see to it that we will teach that neighbor a lesson. I want to ask you a question. That in this world, who do you love the most? Number one. Who do you love the most? Allah. We love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than our mother, more than our father, more than our wife, more than our children. We love him, number one. You ask any Muslim and the reply would be the same. That the person you love the most is Allah. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 88 to 92, Allah says, وَقَالُوا تَقَضُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَى That they say, the non-Muslims, the Jews and the Christians, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son. لَقَدْ جِيْتُمْ شَيْيًا إِدَّى Indeed, they have put forth a thing which is most monstrous. تَقَادُوا سَمَوَاتُوا يَتَفَتَّنَّا مِنُّ As though the skies are ready to burst. وَطَنْ شَقُ الْأَرْزُ The earth to split asunder. وَتَخِرُ الْجِبَالُ حَدَّى And the mountains to fall down to utter ruin. Allah says in the Quran, if anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, if the sky had feelings, the sky would have burst open. If the earth had feelings, the earth would have split open. The mountains would have fallen down to utter ruin. If anyone says that Allah has begotten a son, because anyone who says that Allah has begotten a son, it is one of the most heinous things you can say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We see today, especially in the non-Muslim society, every day, our non-Muslim friends, our non-Muslim colleagues, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are saying Allah has begotten a son and we can't even open our mouth. When we ask a Muslim, who do you love the most? The reply is Allah. When someone wants to abuse our mother, use foul language against our mother, you want to beat him up. You want to bash him. You want to kill him. And every day people are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can't even open your mouth. I'm not telling that you go and bash him. I'm not telling go and beat him. I'm not saying go and kill him. It's not allowed in Islam. You can't kill a non-Muslim because he's abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not allowed just for that. At least open your mouth. When someone is abusing your mother, you want to beat him, you want to bash him. Every day, our non-Muslim friends, our non-Muslim colleagues, they are abusing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can't even open our mouth. Leave aside opening our mouth, we go and become party to them. Very soon, after a couple of weeks, it is going to be Christmas season. And many of us Muslims, we wish our Christian friends Merry Christmas. Leave us at correcting them, you are becoming party to them. You know, the Christians, they celebrate Christmas and they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the son of God. And God begot Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, billah, on 25th of December. Leave us at correcting them, you are congratulating them, you are giving shahada that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knows billah, has begotten a son on the 25th of December. Leave us at correcting them, you are giving shahada. Merry Christmas means what? You're congratulating him and giving witness that knows billah, Allah has begotten a son on the 25th of December. We have to open a mouth. I'm not saying go and beat them or bash them. At least open a mouth. Can't you open a mouth? Non-Muslim society, whether it's a Christian society or a Hindu society, same thing there. The festival, which is very common from where I come, that is Ganesh Chaturthi, Ganpati. And many Muslims go to this festival. And when they offer the prasad, the food which is put in front of the idol, the Muslims know it is haram, but how can they offend their friend? He'll feel bad. So what they do? They say, Bismillah and have it. So tomorrow they'll say Bismillah and have pork. Day after tomorrow they'll say Bismillah and have alcohol. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? We can't even open our mouth. Who are we afraid of? It is so easy. Believe me, to talk is so easy. The only thing you have to open your mouth. 
You don't have to insult him. You don't have to abuse him. Quran clearly says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, revile not those, abuse not those gods worship besides Allah, lest in the ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you do not have to use foul language against them. Only thing you have to ask them simple questions. It's so easy. But we Muslims, we are afraid to open our mouth. We are afraid to do da'wah because if I open my mouth, I will lose this friendship. We are more interested in keeping friends with a non-Muslim than the friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And believe me, if you really speak about haq, they will respect you. The experience that I have in my life, being in a medical college, I never had problems. In fact, when I studied in Bombay, the percentage of Muslims was very few, 5-6%. When asked to speak with the non-Muslims, all my Muslims had run away. Now he's going to give us a bashing. So they run away. But I never had a problem. No non-Muslim has yet caught my collar. Alhamdulillah. When you speak the truth, they respect you. And when I was in medical college, it's compulsory we have to pass in viva voice, in viva. And 50% of our marks and all the subjects were viva. And I asked to dawa even with my professors. Many people said that, if you do too much of da'wah, they will fail you. So I said, no problem. Allah, if he wants that I should do da'wah one more year with them, no problem. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, what should we be afraid of? We should open our mouth. But unfortunately, we Muslims, we are afraid. We are more interested in keeping the friendship of our non-Muslim friends rather than friendship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, Verse number 120. Walan tarda, ankal yahudu, walan nasara, hatta tatabiyu millatihum. The Jews and the Christians, they will never be satisfied until you follow their brand of religion, until you follow their way of life. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111. Waqalu layyat khul jannata illa man kana hudan o nasara. They say, the Jews and Christians, you Muslims, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. With all your piety, with all your salah, with the mark on your forehead, with the fasting you do in the month of Ramadan, with Hajj you have performed, you shall never enter Jannah unless you become a Jew or a Christian. Allah says, Tilka mani yuhum. This is the wishful thinking. Bakwas e bakwas. Kul, tell them. Ha, tu bunanakum. Produce your proof. In kundum sadikin, but if you're truthful. Allah says, if anyone makes tall claims, Tell them, Hatu Bunanakum, produce your proof in Kundum Sadiqin, but if you're truthful. And the Christians, they have produced the Bible in no less than 2,000 different languages. They say, My Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. What do we have to do? Do we have to follow the Bible hook, line, and sinker? When anyone shows you his identity card, what do you do? You verify whether that card is correct or not. So when they are telling you the Bible is the word of God, what do we have to do? We have to analyze the scriptures. How many of us Muslims are analyzing the scriptures? How many of us? Leave aside we doing da'wah to them with their scriptures. These Christian missionaries, they are using our Quran, our Quran against us. The Christian missionaries, they come knocking at our door, and they ask us a question. They come knocking at the doors of the Muslims. And they ask us the question. That isn't it mentioned in the Quran that Bible is the word of God? And most of us will say yes. Then the next question is, then why don't you follow the Bible? And we have got no reply. That's the next question. That how many times is the name of your last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Quran? If you know, you will say five times. Four times as Muhammad and one says Ahmad sallallahu alayhi wa How many times is the name of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Quran? If you don't know, they will tell you Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, by name is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. They ask the next question. Who's greater? A person who's mentioned five times by name in the Quran is greater or a person who's mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran is greater? 
They ask the question, but they will not give you the reply. They let your mind think. They ask the next question. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Did he have a father and mother? We say yes. He had a father and mother. Did Jesus Christ peace be upon him? Did he have a father and mother? We have to agree. That as for the teaching of the Quran, Isa alaihi salam, Jesus Christ peace be upon him, had a mother, but he had no father. They ask the next question. Who's greater? A person who has a father is greater, or a person who does not have a father is greater? A person who's born. By the help of the father is greater, or a person who is born without a father is greater. Who is greater? A person who has a father is greater, or a person who does not have a father is greater. Who is greater? Who is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They are using us Muslims as punching bags, as doormats. They are making nest in our head, and we can't even open our mouth. It's a shame. That's the next question. That did your prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam do any miracles? We say yes. He did several miracles. Do you know of any miracle in which he gave life to the dead? And we have to agree that nowhere does the Quran or any hadith say that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave life to the dead. That's the next question. Did Jesus Christ peace be upon him? Did he give life to the dead? And we have to agree. The Quran says, "Bismillah, wake up in the name of Allah." Yes, He gave life to the dead. So who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater, or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater. Who's greater? A person who can give life to the dead is greater, or a person who cannot give life to the dead is greater. Who's greater? Who's greater? Who? The question is, who's greater? When you say who's greater in English, it has to be one of the two, unless your English is weak. <laughs> they ask the question, but they don't give the reply. They let your mind think. That's the next question. That your prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? And we have to agree. Physically, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam dead. He's buried in Medina. Is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ peace be upon him, is he physically dead or alive? We have to agree that he's alive. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter four, verse 158, that Allah subhanahu wa taala has raised him up alive. So who's greater? A prophet who's dead is greater, or a prophet who's alive is greater? They ask the question, but they don't give you the reply. They let your mind think. They use as Muslims as punching bags, as dough mats and we can't even open our mouth. See, doing dawa is very easy. If you read the Quran with understanding, and if you keep your mind open, doing dawa is very easy. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'alo ila kalmitin sawa imbarina baynakum, come to common terms, as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship men but Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhi zabaad dun abad dun arbaban min dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fainta wallah. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say ibi witness. Be anna muslimoon. That we are Muslims bowing away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran, Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, according to me, is the master key as far as da'wah to non-Muslim is concerned. It's the master key for da'wah. It says, Ta'alo ila kalmitin sawa imbayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bhi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. And if you see the tapes and the lectures that I've given, all these questions have been answered. How to dawah has been explained. It's so easy, the only thing you have to do is open your mouth. The non-Muslim society can be divided into further three categories. One is the category who is religious. There are in the non-Muslim society, in the Western society, there are, since majority are Christians, 
there is a small percentage who are religious. They are Christians and they follow the scripture, the Bible. In other societies like in India, where majority are Hindus, there is a small portion, a small percentage of Hindus who are religious, who follow the scriptures. The best way to dawa with these people is Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im baina bainakum. Come to common terms as we ask you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. We have to speak from their scriptures trying to prove about one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The best thing about dawa, the most important aspect is proving about oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the other aspects are secondary. If you cannot convince a non-Muslim about Tawheed, about monotheism, it is useless. You may speak to him about other aspects of Islam, but if he yet continues doing shirk, it will never be forgiven. Shirk is the biggest sin in Islam, which Allah will never forgive, unless he repents before death. And this way how to do dawah, based on the verse of the Quran, I have dealt in various of my talks, similarities between Islam and Christianity, similarities between Islam and Hinduism, and how to do dawah. For example, living in the Western country, where the majority claim to be Christians, though a small percentage are religious, in bridging the gaps with the Christians, I have given a talk on similarities between Islam and Christianity where I mentioned there, that Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. But one may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is, there are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. He said that he was almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, there is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. I am a student of Islam and compiled religion, and I read the Bible. There is not a single unequivocal statement, not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said that my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devils with the Spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devils. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, for I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is a Muslim. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that ye men of Israel, listen to this, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and signs and miracles which God did by him and you are witness to it. So if we read the scriptures, we can prove from their scripture that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He was the messenger of Almighty God. We can prove from the Bible about the coming, about the advent, about the prophecy of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can give a talk on that. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 18, verse number 18. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 29, verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon, chapter number 5, verse number 16. 
in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 16. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 15, verse number 26. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14. You can only go on giving references from the Bible where the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned. Time doesn't permit us to talk about these aspects. You can refer to my video cassette on similarities between Islam and Christianity or Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Bible. Similarly, if you're living in a non-Muslim society where you have Hindus, you can come to common terms as far as their scripture is concerned and our scripture is concerned. If you're living in Buddhists, it's the same. If you're living with Jews, it's the same technique. So this is as far as one category of non-Muslim is concerned, those who are religious. In today's world, especially the Western world, though people claim to be Christians, very few are actually practicing Christians. They are more impressed with science and technology and most of them, practically, they are atheists. They do not believe in God. So how will you dawa to them? If I meet an atheist and if he tells me that there is no God, the first thing I'll do is I will congratulate him. You will wonder, why is Zakir congratulating an atheist? The reason I will congratulate an atheist is because most of the non-Muslims, they are non-Muslims because of the parents. Most of the human beings, they follow their parents blindly. He's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslim because their fathers are Muslim. This atheist is thinking. His parents may be religious, but he's thinking. He does not agree in the gods which the parents worship. So he says there's no God. And the reason I congratulate the atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. So half my job is done. <laughs> the only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do, inshallah. See, the atheist, as I told you, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, is the master key for dawa. Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbayna baynakum. Come to common terms, I have been us and you. There are many Muslims who ask me that what is the commonality between the atheist and the Muslim? I said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha. There is no God. Because half my job is done. To another non-Muslim who believes in a God, first I have to prove to him that the God is worshipping is wrong. And then I have to talk to him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He has already said La ilaha. There is no God. Only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do inshallah. Now, most of these atheists, as I told you, they have become atheists because they believe in science and technology, which they feel is so advanced, and they become atheists. And after congratulating him, I ask him a question. That, suppose there is an equipment, there is an object, which no one in the world has ever seen, no human being has seen, if it is brought in front of you, and if the question is asked, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, of this object. If I ask this question to an atheist, that an object or an equipment which no human being has ever seen in this world, if it's brought in front of that atheist, and if he's asked the question, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment, what reply can he give you? What reply can he give you? Creator, Manufacturer, some may say creator, some may say manufacturer, some may say producer, some will say inventor. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Just keep it at the back of the mind. Either the atheist will tell you a creator, a manufacturer, a producer, an inventor. It will be somewhat similar. Or maker. Keep it at the back of the mind and continue. Ask him the next question. That how did this universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell you that we have come to know that initially our whole universe was one primary nebula. Later on, there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, and the earth on which we live. 
This they call as the Big Bang. If you ask the question to atheists, when did you come to know about this Big Bang? He will tell you, 30 years back, 40 years back, we came to know how the universe came into existence in the Big Bang. You ask him the question. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaanat ratkan fafatakna huma. The heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you're talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? The atheist may say, maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue. You have to ask me the next question. That what is the shape of this earth on which we live? So he will tell you that previously, the human beings, they believe that the earth was flat. It was in 1577, it's a Francis Drake. He sailed around the earth that he proved that the earth was spherical. You ask him the question, the Quran mentions the spherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, where Allah says, Wal ard baad azalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth X shape. The earth we live in is not completely round like a ball, it is geospherical shape, it is flattened from the poles. And the egg that is referred in the Quran, dahaha, one of its meanings is an expanse, one of the meanings is an egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Imagine, the Quran speaks about the geospherical shape of the earth 1400 years ago. You ask the question to the atheist, that who could have mentioned this in the Quran? We will tell you, oh, maybe your prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an intelligent man. Don't argue, continue. You ask him the next question, that the light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So he will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected light of the sun. Yesterday in science means 40 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who has made the constellations in the skies and placed therein sun having a light of its own and moon having borrowed light, having reflected light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon was not its own light, but it was a reflected light, but it was a borrowed light? Again, the atheist may say, maybe your prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a very intelligent person. Don't argue with him. Continue. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982. I had learned that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. Is that what is mentioned in the Quran? I said, no, this is what I learned in school. I learned in school that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the day and the night. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. The Arabic word yes, bahun describes the motion of a moving body and it says that the sun, besides revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. And today science tells us, with the help of an equipment, we can have the image of the sun on the tabletop and the sun has got black spots and it takes approximately 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation, indicating that the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned this? What I learned in school 23 years back, now the science says it is wrong. And the Quran has mentioned this 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? The atheist may give a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. Today, scientists tell us that our universe is expanding. The same message is given in the Quran 1400 years ago. In Surah Dhariyat. Chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space, the expanding universe. In the field of hydrology, it was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 who was the first person who described the present water cycle which we learn in school. 
Previously, we did not know about the water cycle. The first person was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 that he described that the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, it moves into the interior, it falls down as rain, and the water table is replenished. Now, this water cycle is described in the Quran in great detail in several places. In Surah Zumur chapter 39, verse 21, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse number 24, in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23, verse number 18, in Surah Hijar chapter number 15, verse 22, in Surah Nur chapter number 24, verse 43, in Surah Rum chapter number 30, verse 48, in Surah Raj chapter number 13, verse number 17, in Surah Araf chapter number 7, verse number 57, in Surah Furqan chapter number 25, verse 48 to 49, in Surah Fatir chapter 35, verse number 9, in Surah Qaf chapter number 50, verse number 9, in 11, in Surah Waqiyah, Chapter 56, verse 68 to 70. In Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. You can keep on giving references only of water cycle mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. You can talk for several minutes on each verse talking about water cycle. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And they just would be silent. Keep on. There are several scientific facts mentioned in the Quran. The Quran speaks about geology. Today, science tells us that the mountains give stability to the earth. If the mountains were not there, the earth would shake. The Quran says in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, that we have created the earth as an expanse, while Jabala Autada and the mountains at stakes. Today, science tells us that the portion of the mountain you see above the ground is a very small portion. The major portion is deep within the ground. Like how when you put a tent peg in the ground, small portion remains on top, the major portion goes down. And these roots of the mountain, they give stability to the earth. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, that we have created the mountain standing firm on the earth, lest it would shake with you. In the field of oceanology, we knew previously that there were two types of water, salt and sweet. But we did not know that why these two water did not mix. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has created two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and the other salty. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier between them which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science advanced, we have come to know that though one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area, the Quran refers to as barzakh, an unseen barrier, which science has discovered today. And Quran has mentioned 1400 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّا شَيْنْ hai. We have created every living thing from water. Who could have believed 1400 years ago, that every living creature is made of water. Today, science has confirmed that everything is made from water. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, we have created every human being from water. In the field of botany, Quran says that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. In Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse 53, which we came to know recently. Quran says that every kind of fruits are created in pairs in Surah Rath, chapter number 13, verse number 3. In the field of zoology, Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the animals in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38. Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bees in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69. Quran speaks about the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 41. About the ant in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 to 18. And all these aspects of the spider, of the ants, of the bees, we have come to know recently, and Quran mentions in detail 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned this? Quran speaks about medicine, that in the honey there is healing for humankind. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 to 69. Quran speaks about the production of milk and the circulation of blood. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse 21, 1400 years ago, which we have come to know recently. Quran speaks about medicine, about physiology, about embryology. The various stages of the human development is described in detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. Quran speaks about genetics, about the sex responsible for the child. In Surah Najm, chapter number 
53, verse number 45. Quran speaks about the fingerprinting method in Surah Qiyama, chapter number 75, verse number 3 and 4. After every scientific fact mentioned in the Quran, ask the atheist who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago. And his reply would be the creator, the manufacturer, the maker, the inventor. This creator, this manufacturer, this maker, this inventor, we Muslims, we call him as Allah. Even to an atheist, we can prove about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the help of the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran. We are not using science to prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The science is the yardstick of the atheist. Our yardstick is the Quran. We are using our yardstick and comparing with his yardstick and trying to prove that our yardstick, the glorious Quran, is far superior to your science. So these type of non-Muslims do dawah based on the similarities. If he thinks science is ultimate, we use science and try and get science and the commonalities in the Quran and try to get him closer to Islam. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. We have to dawah with hikmah and with husna. Today, the times have changed. Especially after 9-11, we find that the Muslims are on the receiving end. There is virulent propaganda about Islam on the international media whether it be the international newspapers, the international magazines, the radio broadcast stations, the television channels, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. They are bombarding people with misinformation about Islam. It's the duty of every Muslim that he tries to remove these misconceptions. There are various styles of doing dawah. The most commonly used is that you speak a thousand good things about Islam to a non-Muslim. Even if you speak a thousand good points about Islam to a non-Muslim, and even if he agrees with those thousand points, yet, at the back of his mind, he'll think, ah, you are the same Muslim who's a terrorist. Ah, you are a fundamentalist. Ah, you are the same Muslim who marry more than one woman. Ah, you are the Muslims who subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the veil. These few negative points at the back of the mind will prevent the non-Muslim from accepting the beauty of Islam. What I personally prefer, that whenever I meet a non-Muslim, I ask him up front, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? With your limited knowledge, whether right or wrong, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And I make him comfortable. You can ask any question on Islam, you can criticize Islam, you can attack Islam. I will try my level best to reply. And in the experience that I have of more than a decade in the field of Dawah, I've come to know that there are about 20 common questions which the non-Muslims have regarding Islam. And when they ask you three or four questions, invariably it falls amongst these 20 common questions. So if you know the reply to these 20 common questions asked by the non-Muslims, based on Quran, Hadith and their scripture, with reason, logic and science, even if you cannot convert him, at least you can neutralize him. You can remove the animosity which is there in his heart. I've written a book called The Replies to the Questions Asked by the Non-Muslims. And these questions arise depending upon how the media portrays Islam. And today, the number one question is regarding the Islamic word jihad. It was number five on the list previously. After 9-11, it became top of the charts. The others have come behind, but it's yet there. Time will not permit me to reply to all these. Inshallah, in tomorrow's talk, I will deal more with this topic about terrorists, about fundamentalists, about extremists, etc. in detail. I'll just tell you how to reply to the top of the charts. That is jihad. As far as this word jihad is concerned, there is not only a misconception among the non-Muslims, there's even a misconception among the Muslims. Most of the people think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be personal gain, whether it be for power, whether it be for money, it is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for his personal gain, for personal money, for power. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive. 
which means to struggle. In Islamic context, it means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Many non-Muslims, mainly the Orientalists, they translate the Arabic word jihad as holy war. And unfortunately, many so-called Muslim scholars in inverted commas, even they translate jihad as holy war. In Arabic, if you translate holy war into Arabic, it would be harbu muqaddasa. And if you read the Quran, nowhere is the word harbu muqaddasa mentioned in the Quran, neither it is mentioned in the Hadith. So jihad does not mean holy war. Holy war was first used to describe the crusades with the Christians. They killed tens and thousands of human beings in the name of religion. That holy war was used to describe the crusades. Unfortunately, today it is used to describe jihad, which is totally a mistranslation. Jihad basically means to strive and means to struggle. One type of jihad can be kital, that is fighting, which is kital fi sabilillah, fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that too has got various rules and regulations, which you can refer to my video cassette, Jihad and Terrorism and Islamic Perspective, which I've dealt in detail about this. And I'll just give an example how to do dawah. Last year I had gone to States, last year, year before last. I had gone to states in Los Angeles and traveling, alhamdulillah, mashallah, different parts of the world in various countries, including the Western countries several times, USA, Canada, Australia, and other parts. I was prepared the way I'm dressed up with a cap, with a beard, with a coat. I was sure that in the US customs, I'll be asked for interrogation. So as I went to the immigration, they asked me the question that, why have you come here? I said that I've come here to receive an award. They asked me, what award? I said, award in service of humanity. Said, what do you do? I said, I spread truth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon I said, speak the truth and truth shall free you. And after asking many questions, I see to it that I pick up every opportunity to dawa. While going to the customs, I purposely mentioned that I've come for a convention, like I came this time, and I've come to receive an award. So they asked me, okay, go and open your bag. When they opened my bag, they saw a tape of mine, a videotape, that time videotape I taken. Jihad and terrorism. <laughs> so the custom officer, he asked me, that do you believe in jihad? I said, yes, I believe in jihad. Jihad means to strive and struggle. Jesus Christ, peace be upon, believed in jihad. He said, no, no, I'm talking about do you believe in fighting? I said, yes, even Jesus Christ, peace be upon, believed in fighting. If you read the Bible, in the Old Testament, book of Exodus, chapter number 22, he speaks about fighting. Book of Exodus, chapter number 32, speaks about fighting. Book of Numbers, chapter number 31, speaks about fighting. Jesus Christ, peace be upon, mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 22. He said that, take the sword and go and fight. So they said, but that was fighting against the evil. I said, yes, that's what the Quran says too. We have to fight against the evil. And in this way, when I started doing dawah, the customer officers all gathered together and there was a small mini lecture. I only told my host that, don't worry, I'm just doing dawah in the immigration and the customs. And sir, can we ask you one more question? Sir, can we ask you one more question? And to cut the story short, you should grab every opportunity and you should try and turn the tables over. Give the answer which he expects the least. But I don't want everyone to do that, otherwise they may get into problems. As far as dealing on the higher level where to turn the tables over, you have to be careful, otherwise you get into a problem, then they'll say, okay, Dr. Zakina told me that. Depending upon the situation, you can prove from the Bible that what they attack about the Quran. The same thing is mentioned in the Bible. When I'm in India, I use a different strategy. The master key is the same, but I speak about Bhagavad Gita, I speak about Mahabharat. When the Hindus say that the Quran is wrong, it speaks about fighting. I tell them that there are more verses of fighting in Mahabharata than the Quran. But then they tell me, no, but this is a war between truth and falsehood. I said, same as what the Quran says. It is a war between the truth and falsehood. Then the Hindus tell me we have got no problem with the Quran. And if you read Bhagavad Gita, which is the most popular scripture of the Hindus, in chapter number one, verse number 43 to 46, 
Arjun. There's a fight between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Pandavas are five brothers, Kauravas are total 100 brothers. So Arjun, one of the Pandavas, in the battlefield, he puts his weapons on the battlefield, on the ground. And he says to Sri Krishna, who is God of the Hindus, he tells to Sri Krishna, I would prefer being killed unarmed rather than to fight against my cousin. Immediately next few verse, chapter number two, verse number two and three, Sri Krishna, who's supposed to be the God, he tells Arjun, how could such impurities come in your heart? How could you be so important? He calls him important. And further, Bhagavad Gita chapter two, verse number 31 onwards, he says, it is the duty of the Kshatriya to fight. If you don't fight, you will not go to the heavenly planet. It will take you away from the heavenly planet. And blessed are those Kshatriyas who get an opportunity to fight. And most of the critics of Islam, they point out a common hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi of Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, in the book of Jihad, hadith number 46, where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said that if a Mujahid goes to the battlefield, if he's killed, he will get Jannah, he'll go to heaven. If he comes back alive, he will get the booty of this world. He'll get the wealth of this world. And many critics, whether Christian, Hindus, they point this hadith and say, what kind of religion is this? It's talking about jihad, fighting, and you go to heaven. What kind of religion is this? I tell the Hindus that if you read Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, verse number 37, Sri Krishna tells Arjun that, oh Arjun, rise and fight. If you are killed, you will go to Swarg, heavenly planets. If you come back alive, you would get the wealth of this world. It is the verbatim translation of Sai Bukhari, volume 4, Hadith number 46. So when these critics of Islam, especially the Hindus, like Arun Shuri, I wonder that they haven't read their own scriptures and they're pointing all in the Quran. The moment you give the context and speak to them, the complete misconception is washed away. Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbayna baynakum. Come to common terms as we ascend you. So it's the duty of every Muslim that he conveys the message of Islam to the non-Muslims. Dawa is fard. But unfortunately today, we Muslims, we give excuses for not doing the job. When we tell them, why don't you do dawa? They say, inshallah, when we get the knowledge, we start doing dawa. The time will never come. If you think you'll wait till you become like Sheikh Dida and then start doing dawa, the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, balli go anni walo aya. Propagate even if you know one verse. Even if you know one verse about Islam, as long as you know it correctly, you have to do your job. At least the Muslims know there is one God. At least tell that. You know about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the messenger. He's the last and final messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. At least tell that. If they ask you the question, how do you prove it? If you don't know, come back and do your homework. I've given the talk on is the Quran God's word proving that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've given the talk on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the various world religious scriptures. Come home and do your homework. In this way, inshallah, Allah will help you and you'll be able to convey the message of Islam. Some Muslims come and tell me, the brother Zakir, first we want to make the Musalman pakka Musalman. We want to make the Muslims practicing Muslims and then we'll do dawah to the non-Muslims. I say the time will never come. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he himself could not convince his own uncle. Do you think you're better than the Prophet? In the farewell pilgrimage, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the Sahabas, there were 110,000 Sahabas, that did I deliver the message to you? And all of them said, Beishak, yes, verily you have done it. The Prophet told them that all those who are present here, deliver the message to those who are not present here. And out of 110,000 Sahaba, more than 100,000 Sahabas, they were buried outside the Arab land. Doing what? Making Muslim pakka Muslim, making Muslims practice Muslims. They went to do dawah. In Medina, there were Muslims who did not come for the compulsory congregation salah, did not come for the Juma salah. The Prophet said he felt like burning their homes. Yet, he sent messengers to the king of Abyssinia, king of Persia, king of Yemen, asking them to accept Islam. He did not say, first I'll make all the Muslim, 100% practicing Muslim, and then do dawah. Doing dawa is fard on every Muslim. It's compulsory. But many of the Muslims tell me that when we start doing dawa to the non-Muslims, 
they tell us to mind your own business. I tell them, if a non-Muslim tells me to mind my business, I will say, that's what I'm doing. It's the duty of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. So by doing dawah, I'm minding my business. That is my business. It is the business of every Muslim to mind other person's business as far as deen is concerned. It is fard on every Muslim to convey the message of Islam. And one of the criteria to go to Jannah, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, where Allah says, Wal-Asr, by the token of time, man is well in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawah, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, minimum four criteria are required. Iman, righteous deeds, dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these are missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering five times Salah, you may have gone for Hajj, but if you don't do Dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Only Dawah is also not sufficient. All four are equally important. Iman, righteous deeds, Dawah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If you do not do Dawah under normal circumstances, you shall not enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that's his business. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 116 and verse number 48, that Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive you. So if you don't do dawah and Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. But under normal circumstances, according to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. And especially to those Muslims who are living in a non-Muslim society. It's an awwal fard. It's compulsory for every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, in no less than three different places, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, and Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah says, huwa lazi arsala rasul hu bil huda, wa deen al haq liu zira wa ala deen kulli, falo qaril mushikun. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth, so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life, whether it be Christianism, whether it be Judaism, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be Buddhism, whether it be communism, whether it be atheism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulle, master them all. How much the mushrik don't like it. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that his deen will prevail, will supersede all the other ways of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah himself is sufficient to make his deen prevail. He does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. He is giving us an opportunity to do a prophet's job and do on a prophet's reward. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 33, which says, Woman ahasunu kawla mimman doilallahi wa amilu saliho. Who is better in speech than one who invites to the way of thy Lord, works righteousness, and says that I'm a Muslim? Jazakallah khair. I hope, inshallah, that we will benefit from the words and advice of our brother, Dr. Zakir Naik, inshallah. Time is ticking on, and I would like to immediately go into the question and answer session. I would like to lay out the ground rules for this part of the program, inshallah. Questions not relevant to the topic, including any general question on religion, will not be permitted. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. Only one question at a time may be asked. For your second question, you will have to go at the end of the queue and await your second chance to ask a question. Non-Muslim brothers and sisters will be given first preference to ask questions. Two mics have been provided in the auditorium. I believe there is one here to the left. There's one here to the right. The 
format will be that the sisters will use the mic to my left and the brothers will use the mic to the right. We will allow one question at each of the mics in clockwise rotation, written questions on slips of papers available to, with our volunteers on the sides and in the central aisles will be given secondary preference after Dr. Zakir Naik finishes answering the questions asked on the mic and only if time permits. So kindly state your name and your profession before putting forth your question. I would like to ask you, those brothers to, uh, and sisters to ask who wish to ask questions to form an orderly queue and we will commence in just a few moments, inshallah. Are there any non-Muslims in our audience who would like to ask questions? Please come forward, the mic is free and we will give the non-Muslims preference, inshallah. Good evening and salam alaikum to everyone. I'm uh, Councillor Navin Shah, leader of Hero Council. I'd like to uh, give a very warm welcome to Zakir Bhai on behalf of Hero Council and multicultural, multi-faith community of Hero. You're very, very welcome. Since I'm limited to one question, I will follow the discipline. It's been very thought-provocating address. I'm very grateful for that. You have analyzed, to some degree of detail, various religions, the Islam, the Hinduism, Judaism, and even atheists. Is it a question of equality of religions? Or do you reckon that there is a case for supremacy of one religion against another. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question. That is there a question of supremacy of one religion over the other religion? Basically, what is the meaning of the word religion? Religion means a way of life. I rather believe what the Quran says. Rather than talking about supremacy, the Quran says, Tala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as been us and you. If there is a question of supremacy, then each one will try and prove that religion is the best. So rather the Quran advises when we speak with people following other religion, is ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as been us and you. So I personally disagree with the interfaith dialogues that take place normally in the world. Normally what happens is that there is a person coming from the Christian faith, priest, and coming that all religions are the same. Christianity is the same, Hinduism is the same, Islam is the same. Then you have a Hindu Pandit coming and saying Hinduism is also correct and same, Islam is the same, Christianity is the same. Then they get Joker Muslim who comes and says that Islam is the same, Hinduism is the same, Christianity is the same. See, I being a student of Islam and compared religion, it's a big lie to say that all religions are the same. There are commonalities, but they aren't the same. There are differences. I can talk more about differences than the similarities, but the Quran encourages to talk about similarities. What my strategy is, brother, that I tell that at least let us agree that one religious scripture is 100% perfect. So the Christian will say, fine, I don't mind believing that Bible is 100% the word of God. The Hindu would say, I would not mind believing the Vedas to be the word of God. The Muslim will say, I don't mind considering Quran to be the word of God. I'm not trying to put anything on the top of somebody's head, not going to put anything down the throat. Now what I say, that what is common in all these scriptures, at least let us agree to follow that strictly. What is different, we'll discuss it later on. So when we come and try and find the commonalities in all these scriptures, we find that the commonality is the same. All of the religious scriptures say believe in one God. I gave you references from the Bible. Bible, Moses, peace be upon him, said in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number six, verse number four, Shama Israelo, Adne Hinod Nechad. Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is asked that which is the first of the commandment, he repeated verbatim the same thing in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Shama Israelo, Adnel Haino Adnei Chad, which means Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. If we read the Hindu scriptures, if we read the Upanishads, it's mentioned in Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ekkam Evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is one without a second. It's mentioned in the Shweta Shatar Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. 
Nacha Sikasij Janita Nachadipa, which means of that God, he has got no superior, he has no Lord, he has got no parents, he has got no mother, he has got no father, he has got no superior. It's mentioned in Shweta Shatar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Nata Sipatima Asti. Of him, there is no images. I can give quotations from Bhagavad Gita, Upanishad, Veda, several, talking about oneness of God. So I say that why don't all of us believe in one God? Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20 says that all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods, they do idol worship. So if you read the Vedas and Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, they say there's one God. It's against idol worship. They don't believe in Almighty God coming down. They believe in Almighty God sending messengers. So I say that let us, the Hindus, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims, at least believe that we worship none but one Almighty God. And that God has got no images. He cannot be begotten. It's mentioned in the Bible. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in the Quran. If you studied all these scriptures, the next point you come to know which is common is that there's going to come a final and last messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I give you quotations in my lecture about Judaism and Christianity. I can give you references even from the Hindu scriptures. If you read Bhavishya Purana, Parvatri, Khandatri, Adhetri, Shlokas 10 to 27, it speaks about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you speak about Kuntap Suktas, Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 127, verse number 1 to 14, speak about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a book called as Kalki Purana. It speaks about an avatar, a Kalki avatar to come. It's mentioned in the Hindu scriptures in Kalki Purana that there is a final avatar, Antim Rishi, last messenger going to come, whose mother's name shall be Sumati, which means peaceful, which means Amina. It says the father's name shall be a one who worships Almighty God, Vishnu Yash. Translating to Arabic, it means Abdullah, the name of the parents of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It says that he will be born on the 12th month of Madhav, which is 12th Rabbi Awal. It says that he will be the last and final messenger. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, last and final messenger. It says that he'll be held with four companions, talking about the first four caliphs of Islam. And on and on, he'll be born in the place which is known as peaceful. Sambhala, which is Makkah. He'll be born in the family of the chief of Makkah. I've given the talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Hindu scriptures. So second point of commonality is according to me, after being one God, you have to follow the last and final messenger to come. That is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It speaks about life after death. The Jewish scriptures, Christian scriptures, Hindu scriptures, and Islam. When Hindu scripture speaks about Punar Janam, it speaks about next life. It doesn't speak about life, death, life, death. That's a misconception. Punar means next, Janam means life. We believe in life after death, but not being born and death, born, dying, born, dying. That's a misconception. So what I say, at least let us agree what is common. So all the major religious scriptures, whether it be Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, speak about one God and speak about a final messenger to come whose name shall be Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if all of them follow the last and final messenger, they'll have to follow the revelation given to them, have to follow the Quran. So rather than talking about supremacy, we have to go back. There's only one religion. And the one religion as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in Nadina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God is submitting your will to Almighty God. Islam, submitting your will to Almighty God. It's not a label, a person by keeping his name Muhammad, Sultan, Abdullah, Zakir, he will not go to heaven just by having a Muslim name. Muslim is a person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Almighty God. So all the religious scriptures that came previously, brother, by the passage of time, they have been changed. Quran is the last and final revelation which has been kept in its pure form. But in spite when all the other scriptures have been changed, according to the scholars, you read the books of Hindu scholars, of Christian scholars, they say the scriptures have been changed. But even after they have been changed, there are remnants of truth in them, which speak about the last and final message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and talking about one God. So if you go back to your scriptures and at least follow the commonalities, then nothing like supremacy will culminate only to one religion that is submitting our will to Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Can I ask if there are any sisters who are non-Muslims who would like to ask a question first on the sister's side? Is there any non-Muslim sister 
which is to ask a question. Good evening, Dr. Naik. My question to you this evening is, with all due respect to Islam, you said that idol worship is the greatest sin in Islam and Allah does not forgive an idol worshipper for this. But what about people who have been born into families of religions other than Islam? For example, in India, most of the population is Hindu and lifelong they may not have had exposure to Islam or somebody else who may have educated them about that. What is the fault of those people? Will they never reach paradise? Will Allah never let these people enter paradise? What is their fault if they believe what is being taught to them since the day they were born? Does Allah not have mercy on them? Thank you. Just a very good question, a very logical question. What about those human beings who are born in non-Muslim families and the parents are doing idol worship? So who's to blame? How can Allah punish them? And that's a very good question. That is the reason our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. Every child is born as a Muslim. Irrespective whether he's born in a Jewish family or a Christian family or a Hindu family or a Muslim family, he is born as a Muslim. Muslim, as I told earlier, by definition means a person who submits his will to Almighty God. So every child when he's born, he submits his will to Almighty God. Later on, he's influenced by his elders, by his parents, by his teachers. Then he may start doing idol worship, he may start doing fire worship, and he may go to the wrong path. That's the reason whenever a non-Muslim accepts Islam, the more appropriate word is revert. It's not convert. Convert means going from one faith to another faith. Revert means a person was on the right faith, went to a wrong faith and came back to the right faith. So the more appropriate word, sister, is revert. Now coming to your question, how can Allah hold responsible a person if he is born in a non-Muslim family? That's the reason if a child is born in a non-Muslim family, before he gains maturity, if he dies, he will go to Jannah, inshallah. Why? Every child submits his will to Almighty God. He's a Muslim. He may have a... Hindu name or a Christian name, John, Ramu, it doesn't make a difference. But as long as he's a child, and if he dies as a child sister, that child will go to Jannah, irrespective whether he's born in a Muslim family or non-Muslim family. Later on, when a child grows up and he becomes an adult, then it is his responsibility what he does. That's the reason if a child commits a crime, the court is lenient. When he becomes an adult, then he cannot say that my father taught me to rob, therefore I'm robbing. If a child grows up at the age of 22 and if the police catches him after robbing, he cannot say that my father taught me to rob, therefore I'm robbing. Will the judge let him go? If he's a child at the age of five, the judge may say, fine, he's a child, he hasn't attained maturity. But once he becomes an adult, and then if that adult tells the judge that I'm robbing because my father taught me to rob, he will not be excused. Everyone is responsible for his or her own deed. Now, once a person becomes an adult, it's the duty of that adult to find the truth. It's the duty of us Muslims to convey the message to the non-Muslim. But irrespective whether a person gets the message or not, if a human being is let free, there were two tribes which did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. One tribe was the Kapauku tribe and the second was the Australian Aborigines. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. And when researchers went and tried to find out what was the way of life, it was nothing but Islam. But they didn't call themselves Muslims. They believed in one God. They believed that God had got no images. He had no idols. They prostrated when they worshipped God. It was everything of Islam but in name. So if a child is not given any external influence, he submits his will to Almighty God and remains on that path. Now, once a person becomes an adult, it's the duty of us Muslims to convey the message of Islam. If we do not convey, Allah will hold us responsible. He'll hold us responsible. But, irrespective whether we do the job or not, we'll be held responsible. But, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest region of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Allah has taken upon himself that he will directly convey this message to every human being himself. So if a Muslim does his job or not, whether we have good examples or bad examples, Allah will directly put in the heart of every human being 
whether Muslim or non-Muslim, about the truth about one God. So once the message comes, that human being may follow, may not follow. He may not follow thinking that if I accept Islam, I may have to give up the things which I like, I may have to give up my alcoholism, I may have to give up dating and dancing and, you know, whatever thing which is haram in Islam. He may not accept the message, then he's responsible. Similarly, if the father teaches him something wrong, to rob, it's his duty to realize that robbing is haram. It's a sin. It's the thing which is wrong. He cannot go and tell the judge that because my father taught, therefore I'm robbing. Similarly, here when Allah directly puts the message into the heart of every human being about the haq, about the oneness of God, and the idol worship is prohibited, yet if the individual continues, he or she is responsible. So on the day of judgment, therefore Allah says that no non-Muslim will ever object to the justice of Allah. Because your organ will give witness about you. Your eyes, your hands will speak about you. So on the day of judgment, even those people will be put in hell, they will never object to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What they will say, please give us one more chance and Allah will say it's too late. There are many chances given in this world, but you live only once in this world. So on the day of judgment, no non-Muslim, no human being, even if he's put in hell, will ever object to the justice of Allah. He'll only say that, please forgive me, and it will be too late. Whatever is there in this world, this world, as Allah says in Surah Mul, chapter 6 and verse number 2, is a test for the hereafter. Hope that answers the question, sister. Is there any other non-Muslim who wishes to ask a question to Dr. Zakir Naik? If not, then you may proceed, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Naveed Ahmed and I'm a surgeon. To be a good surgeon, you need to be well trained. I just wanted to ask Dr. Naik to do dawa well. How important do you think training is? There was a question that he's a surgeon and to be a surgeon, he had to be trained. To dawa, don't you have to be well trained? Yes, brother. But the question is, our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said in Sahih Bukhari, Balligo anni walo aya, propagate even if you know one verse. So if you know one verse, at least go and convey that. If you say that I will wait till I become like Sheikh Ahmad Dida and then start doing dawah, that time will never come. So the thing, the criteria for doing surgery, you have to get your degree. If you don't get your degree, and if you do surgery, you may be arrested or you may put behind bars, fine? Similarly for dawah, even if you know one verse, as long as you know it correctly, you have to do dawah. Now, as in medicine, you may have MBBS, then there is MD, then there is DM, MS is there, then MCH is there, fine? The more you keep on spending time, the more you'll become an expert. Now, for doing a surgery, you may spend minimum about six, seven years, correct? Only after passing your 12th standard or A-level, whatever it is here. How much time have you spent for dawah? How much? So when we want to become an engineer, you spend four years. When you want to become a doctor, you spend five years. Dawa you want to do overnight. You can't become an expert overnight, but at least you make a beginning, at least open your mouth. As far as I'm concerned, in my childhood, I was a stammerer. Even in my adulthood, I was a stammerer. If you ask me what was my name, my name is Zah, 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 Zakir. That was me. When I met Sheikh Ahmed Dida, I was inspired by him and I started doing dawah, and I realized when I spoke with non-Muslims, I never used to stammer. Normal, a normal human being, when he comes on the stage, he will stammer. In my dreams, I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world. I could have dreamt, you know, in your dreams you can dream anything. But I couldn't dream of speaking in front of 25 people. I was a stammerer. And now, alhamdulillah, with Allah's help, I'm giving talks in front of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands. I've been given a talk in front of a million people live, alhamdulillah. So if you go back, if you see my life back, I would be the last person, one of the last category who could do dawah. But I did jihad. Jihad means to strive. I didn't take a sword. To strive and struggle, I did jihad. I strived and I struggled and Allah opened up the pathways. Allah says in Surah An Kabut, chapter 29, verse number 69, if you strive in Allah's path, Allah will open up your ways. I strived, alhamdulillah. And the moment I got involved in the field of dawah, my stammering went away. Yet I do stammer sometimes off the stage. But on the stage, alhamdulillah, Allah helps me. It's a miracle. I was inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didad. Whatever I learned, whatever I heard from his cassettes, I started talking. 
I started talking, Allah kept on helping me more and more. And now I'm here. Even if I'd been the best surgeon in the world, all of you wouldn't have gathered here, correct? And the respect that Allah has given me at this young age, even if I'd been the best surgeon in the world, the people that want to meet me, the people I meet, the kings, the sheikhs, the ministers, Alhamdulillah. I never did dawah for fame or popularity. I took up medicine, I'm a medical doctor, because I thought it was the most noble profession. It is, Alhamdulillah, I'm not saying no. But I found a nobler profession. Therefore, I changed from a doctor of the body to a doctor of soul. But the best thing, brother, whatever you have heard today, people normally enjoy, they clap, tomorrow back to work, they are the same. When they go back to work, they should try and repeat something from me what they have heard. At least 10%, if not 10%, 5%, at least 2%, start. And the moment you start, Allah will help you. So the moment you keep on doing dawah, Allah help you. I haven't done any course. I haven't been trained by anyone. Allah, mashallah, help me. And without help, it's not possible. But we have dawah training courses in Bombay, where we train people. It's a short course of about 30 to 40 days, where we train people. And believe me, if you hear the speakers of a foundation, all of them can quote chapter number, verse number, Bible, Bhagavad Gita, Hadith, Quran, Alhamdulillah, at the fingertips. First is the help of Allah. Second is hard work. Third is technique. So number one is Allah's help. Hard work is from you. Technique we give, that is the least important. But you don't wait till you become an expert. What do you know? Start, and then Allah will help you more. Hope that answers the question. I have a question here from a non-Muslim brother. His name is Peter. Dr. Saab, can you explain why is music bad? The non-Muslim friend has asked the question that why is music bad? There's no direct reference in the Quran which speaks about music as being bad. There are indirect references, but there are hadiths of Prophet Muhammad who has commented on music, musical instruments. The only thing he permitted was the duff and the others he had not permitted. The reason being that most of the time when musical instruments are used, it normally puts a person in a trance, in a different frame of mind. And many a times, if you analyze the Quran, the Quran is against songs and poetry. There's a full chapter, Shawara, that speaks about poets. What happens is that normally in songs and music, the songs that are there, if you analyze the words, most of the songs, they are away from reality. And in a song, when people start praising or impressing the opposite person, the more they try to impress the opposite person, the more they deviate from reality. Therefore, in Hindi film songs, you'll find that the hero tells the heroine that Chand tod ke leke aunga, sitare tod ke leke aunga. I'll get for you the moon and get for you the star, which is not possible. And same thing when you're in the English pop and rock. It has no meaning per se, many of the songs. Some have got, not that all. And it takes a person away. And along with the musical instruments, whether it be heavy metal, you know, we find that people go in a frenzy, they take out their clothes and they're a different frame of mind. So most of the time, the music takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the reason the Prophet has discouraged and said that musical instruments should not be used except for the duff that is there. It takes a person away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can I ask... Sister from this side, please. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa Bismillah ar rahman rahim I just wanted to ask about the meaning of the hadith from Sahih Muslim. Ummatul Wahida. The Muslim Ummah is one Ummah at the exclusion of all others. Their land is one. Their war is one. Their peace is one. Their trust is one. And is this hadith relevant to us Muslims living in a non-Muslim society? whose armies are killing Muslims, expelling them from their homes and fighting them as we speak. The sister wants me to throw some light on the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi that the Muslim is one ummah, irrespective of whether you're living. And there are various hadith the Prophet said that it's like one body and if one part of the body is hurt, then all the rest of the body is also in pain. So in that context, as far as the Muslim ummah is concerned, irrespective of whether you're living in a Muslim society or non-Muslim society, whether you're living in UK or America or Saudi Arabia, the Muslim Ummah is one. And if one part of the Ummah is hurt, it's the duty as far as possible, whatever ability a person has got, he should see to it that he helps. So there are various situations, for example, if you know that there's one part of the Muslim Ummah which is poor or doesn't have enough resources to feed themselves, it's the duty of the other part of the Ummah to see to it that they 
give them, whether it be from zakat money or from sadqa money, whatever it is, so that they help the other part of the Muslim Ummah. Now we know the scenario is such that we find that certain portion of the Muslim Ummah, they are being attacked, they are being harmed. So whatever capacity we have and whatever ability we have got, it is a duty that we as Muslims, as our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that if you find anything evil, the best is to stop it with your hand. If you cannot stop it with the hand, then stop it with the tongue. If you cannot stop with the tongue, the least you can do is curse in your heart. And then if you do that, you are the lowest level of a Muslim. So when you see anything wrong, if you can stop it with the hand, do it. If you cannot stop with your hand, then try and stop it with the tongue. If you can't do that, at least curse in your heart. If you find something is happening, maybe a robbery is taking place. If Allah has given you the ability, go and stop with your hand. If you feel that the person, they have got more strength, you are a lean person and there are 10 of them, at least try and stop with your tongue. Please, mister, don't rob. If you can't do that, at least curse in your heart. Now, depending upon the ability that we have got, we have to do that. Now we find, unfortunately, that the scenario that we have, that especially after 9-11, we know that what happened in 9-11 was wrong. Allah clearly mentioned in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 32 that if anyone kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. So killing any innocent human being is haram. So what happened in 9-11? More than 3,000 or 5,000 people were killed, innocent people, and it is to be condemned. Who did it? I don't know. The media says X, Y, Z, I don't know. But whoever did it, it is wrong. What happened in London on the 7th of July, where more than 50 people were killed, innocent human being, it is to be condemned. Whoever did it is at fault. It is wrong. But what we have to realize, that unfortunately, when Muslims live in non-Muslim society, they try to be over-apologetic. We find in America, we find in UK, all the Muslim body get together and they condemned the 9-11. Correct, no problem. They condemned what happened in 7th of July in London, which I do condemn. But in the same breath, we also have to condemn the thousands of people killed in Afghanistan. We also have to condemn... We also have to condemn the thousands of people killed in Iraq. What's happening in Palestine? Every day, Muslims are being killed. What happened in Bosnia? We have to condemn that too. Why do we stop? Unfortunately, when I read reports, all the Muslim bodies get together and they're condemning only part of it. Why? It's the same. What is wrong is wrong. If a Muslim kills an innocent human being, he has to be condemned. Similarly, if a non-Muslim kills an innocent Muslim, even he has to be condemned. Who are we afraid of? But you have to do it with hikmah. If you fear that you opening your mouth will create a problem, but don't mention wrong things. Therefore, as a da'i, we should know how to turn the tables over with hikmah. So what we have to realize, that what is wrong, we have to condemn. And believe me, I've been to America several times, in USA, in Canada, I've been to UK. The thing is that if you realize what a talk I gave on Islam and terrorism, in all time, that was the topic. What we have to realize is that many a times, two different labels are given for the same activity of the same individual. For example, in India, there were many Indians who were fighting for the freedom about 60, 70 years back, when the British were ruling India. Now, these people who fought for the freedom by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But we common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. If you agree with the view of the British government that they had a right to rule over India, you have to call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they have no right to rule over us, then you would call these people as freedom fighters, you would call these people as patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. So before you give a label, you have to first try and find out for what reason is the person striving. If you see the history of American Revolution in the 18th century, in 1775, the Americans got their freedom. The Britishers were ruling them. And the two people who were called number one terrorists was Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, 
according to this british government george washington was terrorist number 1 and later on this same terrorist number 1 become the president of america imagine terrorist number 1 according to british government becomes the president of america and he happens to be the godfather of all the american presidents to follow including george bush so what we see today is whoever is in power what he says carries weight we can give example of the apartheid government of south africa white apartheid government they imprisoned nelson mandela for 25 years they called him terrorist number 1 after the apartheid government was removed in the new south africa Nelson Mandela became the president. A few years later, he got the Nobel Prize for Peace. Imagine the person who was called terrorist number one is given the Nobel Prize for Peace for the same activity. Not that first he was bad and then he became good for the same activity for which he was called a terrorist. Later on, he got the Nobel Prize for Peace. What we come to know, whoever is in power, what he says turns out to be the gospel truth, which is not the case. So what we have to know, we have to go to the root cause. So we as Muslims, what we have to do, sister, is we have to speak for the hak. So if Allah has given you the power with your hand, you can stop it. Do it with your mouth. Do it with your mouth. Least you can do is curse in your heart and pray for the ummah. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zaid Khan, and uh, I work as a lab scientist. My question is, uh, what advice can you give uh, to do practical uh, dawah, such as in town center, where you can build uh, a communication with non-Muslims? We asked the question that how can you do practical dawah in dawah stalls, etc. Rather, the example that I gave in my talk, you can use that. That try and use the strategy of come to common terms. And one thing is having the technique. One thing is knowing how to dawah. For example. How to dawa with a co-passenger who is traveling in a train is a different technique. How to dawa in a dawa store is a different technique. How to dawa in a school is a different technique. For this, we have a dawa training session where we train people how to dawa. You can go to our website irf.net on the DTP dawa training program and the information is there. Hope that answers the question. I have a question here from a non-Muslim. His name is Ravinder. He says, "My name is Ravinder. I'm a non-Muslim." I am a Sikh and I believe that all religions are right and there is one God. Everyone will go to heaven irrespective of being a Muslim, a Sikh, etc. There are different disciplines to reach him, I presume God, Sikhism, Islam, etc. What do you have to say? The brother posed the question. He's a Sikh, he says all religions are right, all religions believe in one God. So what do you have to say? We'll all go to heaven. Brother, I am a student of comparative religion. According to me, all religions are not right. in the religion itself there are many contradictions in the religious scriptures itself now coming to christianity if you analyze in christianity there are so many contradictions in the bible there are so many things which are unscientific in the bible so bible according to me is a mixture it may contain the word of god it contains the word of prophet it contains the word of historians it even contains pornography i'm sorry to say how can i say that this pornography is the word of god there are many mathematical contradictions i can give a talk only in the mistakes in the bible there are so many unscientific things mentioned in the bible the bible says the world is flat i can give a talk on that time doesn't permit me same thing with the vedas though i give talks on the veda there are many things which are disagree in the veda there are things in the veda which say the almighty god created the brahman from the head the kshatriya warrior class from the chest the business class the vaishya from the thighs and the shudras the low class from the feet islam doesn't believe the human being have been created in caste and levels So how can you say all religions are right? Again, you go to the Hindu scripture. It says that if a husband dies, then in the pyre the wife should jump, the widow, which is totally wrong. The Veda says that the sun moves around the earth, which is unscientific. In this, by doing comparative religion, I cannot say that all religions are right. Part of all the religions are right. You can say that, which I wouldn't mind. What I am saying only follow that part which is right. what is wrong you don't have to follow so in this way brother i disagree with you i am a student of compared religion you can see my cassettes i have spoken on various religions on judaism christianity hinduism sikhism buddhism etc so only what is right you have to follow what is wrong you don't have to follow hope that answers the question uh 
Uh, question, please, from this side. We have to uh, end our program very shortly, so I will ask to speed up, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Sabina. Forgive me for my unclarity, this is a rather spontaneous question. Um, I have a friend, she's an atheist, and on our endless debates on the existence of God and all that we talk about, she has two claims, she makes two claims. When I pose her with the question of what the Quran says in terms of the existence of the universe and the world and how it states many facts, she turns around and she says, well, that knowledge was not just for the Quran, it actually existed before the Quran. There's um, scriptures, there is books before the Quran was even written, detailing information about the universe. So it's not just this knowledge that is superior to the Quran. What do I say back to that? Is she lying? Do scriptures exist? I mean, I have ignorance myself, but you know, is this knowledge, like was this available before the Quran was written? And sorry, secondly, another claim she makes is that I give the analogy of you know, you have something in creation, who knows it? You know, the creator will know about everything about it. And I talk about, you know, if there is no God, how can we possibly exist? If you keep on going further and further and further and back, there's no end. And if there's no end, how do we exist? But then she says, well, from a religious point of view, you say, well, God is the end. Well, I say as an atheist, who says God is the end? Who created God? That's my question, thank you. First, I have two questions which I again comment. The first question is that all the things mentioned in the Quran were already present before. So what's new? It's present in other scriptures and other books, etc. That's the first question. The second question is who created God? As far as the first question is concerned, I do agree that certain things were present in time before the Quran. But they were not called as established facts. They were not called as established facts. For example, the thing I quoted that the sun, previously people thought, the sun rotating, there are certain things which were there in the Greek history and the philosophical history. But for example, when the Quran speaks about the spherical shape of the earth, these Greeks, they believed that the earth was spherical, but no one believed in them. So certain facts, not all, a small percentage of what the science has come to know today and what Quran mentions were told by people previously, but they failed to realize that the same Greeks mentioned hundred other things which were unscientific. The same Greek even mentioned that the earth was center of the universe, which is totally wrong. So imagine if hundred points are mentioned and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam picks up one which is correct, that's also not possible. So I do agree with you, sister, that certain things were mentioned before science established as a fact today. But these things weren't established that time. And to say that out of the hundred false things they mentioned, if one thing is right, to pick up the one correct thing is again also not possible. Once it's possible, but not thousands of times, sister. Because only a person who is, even a scientist cannot do that. Only the creator himself can do and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I do agree with you, but that portion which has been mentioned earlier in earlier scriptures and other philosophical books is a small portion, but that too, along with that portion, there are other things which aren't scientific mixed with that. Coming to the second part of the question, that who created God? Normally people in Dawah, they used a false strategy of logic, which tips itself. Most of the people, when they try to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say that everything has a creator. For example, who created this book? How did the book come into existence? Somebody created it. Who created it? And they go back. Where did you come into existence? Who created you? Your father. Who created your father? The grandfather. And then goes to God. Who created this microphone? Created in the factory. Who created the factory? And then they try and prove who created the sun? God. Who created the moon? So based on this, they try and prove that everything has a creator, which according to me is a wrong logic. In my strategy, what I spoke today, I never said everything has a creator. That is the atheist who told me that the first person who will tell about the mechanism of this thing is the creator. I never said that. I say every created thing as a creator. But by definition, Almighty God is uncreated. It is like there's a person, suppose my friend, he comes and tells me that my brother John was admitted in the hospital. He gave birth to a baby. Was it a girl or a boy? Can you guess, sister? Was it a girl or a boy? Brother John gave birth to a baby. Was it a girl or a boy? 
Brother John was admitted to the hospital. He gave birth to a baby. Was it a girl or a boy? Can you guess? You can't guess. Can anyone guess? How can a man have a baby? So to ask the question, he gave birth to a baby. Was it a girl or a boy? Is it logical? The same thing, the definition of Allah is uncreated. The moment you say who created Allah, he ceases to be Allah. Therefore, the definition of God is uncreated. Therefore, Almighty God has got no creator if he's a true Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Uh, due to the shortage of time, I will allow three very quick questions and quick answers, inshallah. So three questions, one, two, three, and we'll have three quick answers, inshallah. Brother, please state your name and your profession. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, my name is Goha. I'm an accountant. Uh, just very quickly, it's a pleasure to hear Dr. Zakir Naik. Since the first time I heard him, it was one of my ambitions to come and see you, mashallah. You gave a lovely talk. My question is, there's a famous hadith saying by the Prophet, peace be upon him, that we should seek knowledge unto China. Now, I've talked to a lot of brothers about this, and my perspective on it, even though I haven't researched it, is that this knowledge does not talk about religious knowledge because the religious knowledge at the time was in Saudi Arabia where the Prophet, peace be upon him, was. And people all over the world were coming to see him at that time for religious knowledge. But what is the question, brother? What is the so question? So my question is, this hadith, does it relate to religious knowledge or knowledge of the dunya, science, maths, etc.? But there's a question that the Prophet said that seek knowledge even if you have to go to China. It's because religious knowledge was in Saudi Arabia, it was worldly knowledge. So does it mean you can go to China for worldly knowledge? Point number one, brother. According to Sheikh Nasir al-Bani, this hadith is a maudu hadith. It's a fake hadith. It's not a correct hadith. Because the center of education even at that time, that time was in China. This hadith is a fake hadith, but that doesn't mean your question is not valid. You have to use other hadith to prove your question. The first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the whole of humanity was not to pray, was not to give zakat, it was ikra. In Surah Al-Alaq, chapter 96, verse number one, ikra. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's mentioned by Haki, it is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman, to acquire knowledge. So acquiring knowledge is further than Islam. It's compulsory. It includes, the more obligatory is the deen knowledge, but that does not mean you cannot go and travel even for worldly knowledge. You can, as long as you fulfill the criteria. Even for worldly knowledge, you can. As long as it benefits you, it gets you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. One more question on the sister side, please, very quickly. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Zarina, um, and I'm a graduate. You may have answered this question in part already. On the question of da'wah, many people ask me, how is it just for a very good, righteous non-Muslim to go to hell? For example, Mother Teresa. Um, what happens to their good deeds, and what is the best way to answer them? Thank you. Sister, has a question, what about the righteous non-Muslim like Mother Teresa? Will she go to heaven or hell? As I mentioned in my talk, the criteria to go to heaven, the criteria to go to Jannah are four, according to Surah Al-Asr. Wal-Asr, inna al-insan la fi khusr, illa lazina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who do dawah, and those who exhort people to patient perseverance. Minimum four criteria are required to go to Jannah. Similarly, when I was in school, I passed my ICSC, in 1992, there were minimum six compulsory subjects. English was there, mathematics, science, history, geography, Hindi, compulsory. I ask you the question, sister. In science, in five subjects out of six, I get 99 out of 100. In one subject, I get 10 out of 100 in science. Will I pass standard 10? Yes or no? No. But I got 99 in English. 99 in Hindi, 99% in history. If I fail in any one subject, I fail. Similarly, to go to Jannah, four criteria are required. Iman, righteous deed, exhorting people to through dawah, and exhorting people to patient perseverance. Now you say Mother Teresa was righteous. Righteousness includes offering salah, giving zakat, many things. But even if I agree with you for sake of argument, or with a non-Muslim, then Mother Teresa was righteous for sake of argument. Huh? In Islam, righteousness includes many things which I feel Mother Teresa didn't have. But even if I agree with you for sake of argument, she gets 99 only in one. 
What about Iman? So if she does shirk, which is even mentioned in the Bible, if you read the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse 7 to 9, and the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5, it says that thou shalt have no other image of me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything that is in the heavens above, in the earth beneath, and the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So doing shirk is even haram in Christianity. And in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, let's see what is the verdict given by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 72, Allah says that, لَقَدْ كَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ هُوَ الْمَسِيُّ بْنُ مَرِيمَ They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming those who say that Jesus, son of Mary, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيُّ But said Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, O'budu Allah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord, إِنَّ مَشْرِكْ بِاللَّهُ Anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ هَرَّ مَلَا لَيُ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannat haram for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِزَالْمِنِ مِنَ النَّفَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, إِنَّ مَشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Anyone who associates partners with Allah, فَقَدْ هَرَّ مَلَا لَيُ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannat haram for him. Paradise will be forbidden for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ وَمَا لِزَالْمِنْ مِنَ النَّفَارِ And fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. So according to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Quran, according to the Bible, if any human being does shirk, whether it be Mother Teresa or anyone else, they shall not enter Jannah. I have to apologize. This will be the last question. We have a number of handwritten questions here. Because of the time constraints, I will apologize we will be unable to cover these questions in part of our program. So, uh, my apologies. Please, brother, can you state the last question? And may I ask the other uh, brothers and sisters to take their seats for the close of the program, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Adil Ahmed. I'm a 16-year-old student doing my GCSEs. Um, and my question regards uh, Dr. Naik's statement previously about saying Merry Christmas to a non-Muslim uh, makes us somehow submit the fact that, well, the idea that uh, Christ was the Son of God, and it makes us one of them. Now, that sort of shocked me in a sense that um, surely Allah, uh, in His uh, almightiness, would know that my intention to saying to someone Merry Christmas is, as you said, just to improve relations. Now, the thing is that most people, uh, at least of my generation, the people who I come in contact with, don't actually celebrate Christmas uh, because they uh, celebrate Christ's birth, but actually it's a commercial thing to get the latest PS2 or whatever it is. Um, so could you just please expand on that? Because I'm sort of confused how saying Merry Christmas could uh, somehow um, bring blasphemy. The brother asked a question that he wants to wish Merry Christmas to his friend so that he can build relationships. So tomorrow he'll ask me the question, why can't I have a peg of alcohol to build relationship? Why not? Why? What's wrong? Why can't I eat some pork with them? Why can't I go to church and worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? See, you don't have to do anything haram for doing dawa. For reaching the goals, you cannot use wrong means, brother. What is haram for them is haram for you also. When you are wishing Merry Christmas to them, you are agreeing that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born on the 25th of December, and you are agreeing that he is the begotten son of God, which is shirk. Why it is wrong? Because the Christians, they believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is the begotten son of God. Now, irrespective of whether he may be a practicing Christian or not, they celebrate because of the birthday. Why don't they celebrate any other day? So if you tell your Christian friend, okay, forget, if you don't believe in that, let's celebrate instead of 25th of December, let's celebrate on the 10th of October. Will they agree? They'll say no. But that does not mean don't do that. Why do that on Christmas? I ask them that this is the Christmas season. Why is it Christmas? So they tell me, oh, it's Christmas because Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born on 25th of December. Who is this Jesus, peace be upon him? Oh, Jesus is the begotten son of God. Then I tell him that can you prove to me from one unequivocal statement from the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that he's God of Israel, worship me. I do dawah. Why do you have to use wrong means for doing dawah? You ask the question, is saying Merry Christmas wrong means? I'm telling you it is wrong. Okay. 100% wrong according to me. If you don't know what Christmas is celebrated for, like by mistake, if you don't know it is alcohol and you think it is Pepsi and you have it, 
Allah may forgive you. So if you don't know what is Christmas standing for being in UK, do you know what Christmas stands for? Well, as of now, Why I think... you come from somewhere outside? Well, uh, as of now, I think uh, it stands for a do commercial... Do you know what... Do I you think know? it stands for a commercial business. That's what it Sorry? stands for. It stands for a commercial business, a, a place where people give each other presents. No, no, commercial. That's what is the excuse? No, don't... It's don't a holiday. It push. I'm asking you the question, do you know what is the excuse for commercial business? What is the excuse? Why yeah. do they celebrate Christmas? For what? Because it's the birth of Christ. Tired, finish. You know about it? And do they consider Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as the son of God, begotten son? Do you know that? Yeah, I know that. If but you I... know that, and then if you wish Merry Christmas, it is haram. If you didn't know, if you're coming from Timbuktu, If you're coming from Timbuktu and you did not know and in ignorance, if you wish, Allah may forgive you. If you don't know that that is alcohol and if you think it is Pepsi and you drink it, Allah may forgive you. But if you know it and you think you're building relationship, you know what you're doing? You're building a place in the Jahannam. So therefore, brother, for reaching any good means, you never have to adopt wrong means. You have to go as the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhir dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Brothers, I'm so sorry. We have no more time. I'm sorry, brother. We have no more time. Uh, my sincere apologies. We cannot ask any more questions. We'll just close with reflections by Brother Shahid Akmal, Chairman of Harrow Central Mosque, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My job was to provide some reflections on the talk by Dr. Zakir Naik. But how do you provide reflections in a few words on such an amazing and such a talk full of such information. I think the best that I can do is to quote the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said, Khairun nasi man yanfa'un nas. The best of mankind is he who brings most benefit to them. And to summarize Dr. Zakir's talk, the best benefit that we can bring mankind is to bring them Islam through Dawah, as Dr. Zakir has so eloquently taught us. On behalf of the committee of the Harrow Central Mosque and the people of Harrow, I'd like to give my personal thanks and our collective thanks to Dr. Zakir Naik, to Sir Iqbal Sakrani, Brother Bashir Sattar and his colleagues. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's time to give, time to forgive all your relatives and friends. It's time to give, it's time to live. Honestly with no pretense It's time to share It's time to care About every move you make It's time to share And to declare The hope in my heart won't break It will never break It's time to speak Not to believe it's time to stand up for us. It's time to seek the highest peace.